So far, we've been talking about derivatives, or slopes of tangent lines, from a purely geometric perspective. We've been looking at a curve, the graph of a function, and just trying to describe its behavior at particular points in the domain. Now, I think that's kind of interesting, so I don't think we need any reason other than that's kind of cool for studying this. But there are lots of applications because very often our functions aren't just these abstract mathematical objects. Very often our functions are going to mean something in the real world. And I want to introduce just a classic example that we'll be using throughout the semester, and that's a position function. So we're going to have t, which is our time. Okay. So position is going to be a function of time. And I'm going to, let's say we're measuring that in hours. Okay. And then P of T is going to be our position. And let's say that the units we're using for that are miles. Okay. I could use any unit of time. Often we'll measure time in seconds. Often we'll measure position in meters. Okay. But here I'm going to measure time in hours and position in miles. Now, there's an important convention we have to recognize. If I'm treating position as a real valued function, then the output of the position function is going to be a number. So I'm using just a single number to represent my position. If I'm talking about single numbers, I really represent those geometrically with a one-dimensional number line. Okay. So I can have some reference position, I'm going to just call that home, which is position zero. And then I can define numbers that are to the right of that would be in the positive direction numbers that are to the left of that would be in the negative direction. So I've got two directions. I'm linking the direction with the sign. And that limits us. That means there are just two directions. Let's suppose I define north to be the positive direction. So now my position would be represented by a positive number because I am north of home. Okay. Let's suppose that direction is south, and south is the negative direction. So now my position is negative. I am south of home. Okay. But those are the only two directions, because we only have two signs. We have a plus sign and a negative sign. So a positive and a negative sign. Okay. So I can move north, I can move south, but if I were to take a step forward, which would be east, this is very exciting. By the magic of video editing, you can see if I step forward, poof, I cease to exist because there is no direction other than north or south. I'm back. Okay. Now, that is somewhat limiting that we only have two directions, the positive and the negative direction. It's not quite as limiting as you might think because I can, for example, take a road like the 5 freeway and I can define the positive direction to be going north along the 5. So I don't have to be traveling in a perfectly straight line. If there's some path that I'm traveling along, I can say going that way is the positive direction and going that way is the negative direction. And you all know what I mean if I say I'm driving north on the 5. It doesn't mean I'm going due north. It means I'm following that path as it moves northward. Okay. So we're going to have something like that. But basically, we've got some path and our position, we can move back and forth along this path, and that's all we can do. Now when we graph a position function, we're going to put time, our input, on the horizontal axis. So instead of an x-axis, we'll have a time axis. Very often, we're only going to be concerned with time from time zero on. In theory, I could have a starting time of time zero and a negative time would just be before then. But most often, we're only going to be concerned with time moving forward from some starting point. And so then I put position on the vertical axis. Okay. So notice, here as I was illustrating it, I drew my number line the way I'm used to drawing number lines. I drew it horizontally. So my positions, I could move right and I could move left. Now we're representing position on the vertical axis. Okay. 
So if I'm above the time axis, my position is positive. That's what I was representing as being north of home before. <laughs> and if my position is below the time axis, it's negative. That would be south of home. If we're going with north as the positive direction and south as the negative direction. Okay. Now, if I have a position function, eh, maybe something like this. So this would correspond to time is p passing as we move forward. This would correspond to I started at home, I moved in the positive direction, then I changed direction, turned around, sort of came back home, then I moved south of home for a while, turned around, and returned to home. A very exciting trip. If I were to enact that, I'm at home, I went this way for a while, I turned around, passed home, went south of home, turned around, came back. That was my exciting journey. Okay, so if I have something like this, what would the derivative or the slope of the tangent line represent? Okay. Well, let's see. I can certainly draw in a tangent line like so, and I can try and see what that would actually mean. I think I'm actually going to start with a secant line instead of a tangent line. Let's just say I was doing a secant line between here and here. Now if I were calculating the slope of the secant line, I know it would just be rise over run. Now I haven't given us any numeric values here, but I can figure out what the units would be for the rise and for the run. And very often seeing what the units are can be helpful in figuring out what it is that, it is, that we're measuring. If I know the units are hours, I know I'm talking about time because that's the only thing I would measure in hours. So if I were to work this out, the units for the slope of this secant line would be the units for the rise. So that's the units on the vertical axis. And we said we were measuring position in miles. Divided by the units for the horizontal axis. And we said the units for time were hours. So whatever it is that the slope of the secant line is measuring would be measured in miles per hour. Now, very often when I point that out and then I ask students, so what do you think? we're measuring when we're taking the slope of a secant line, people will say speed, because we measure speed in miles per hour. I'm just going to point out the slope of the secant line would be negative. I don't think we can have a negative speed. Is it possible for me to drive at negative 60 miles per hour at that speed? No. So the fact that the lot that I gave it away. The fact that the slope is going to be a signed quantity means it's going to have something to do with not just how fast we're going, but what direction. And so it's not speed, it's velocity. Okay. So if I look at the slope of the secant line, it's going to be a velocity, and it's actually going to be my average velocity. It would be the average velocity over the time interval that corresponded to the endpoints of that interval. Now, if I calculate the slope of a tangent line, well, it would also be rise over run, and the units for the rise would still be miles, and the units for the run would still be hours, so I'd also be measuring that in miles per hour, it's going to be an instantaneous velocity. <laughs> so that's going to be what my velocity is right then and there at that exact moment in time. Okay. How fast and in what direction, positive or negative, am I going at that particular moment in time? Okay. And the speed the relationship between speed and velocity is that speed is just the absolute value of velocity. So 
So velocity indicates for me two things. The sign of the velocity indicates the direction that I'm moving in, and then the absolute value indicates how fast. So the absolute value is going to be the speed. Okay, so the title of this section was the tangent line and velocity problems. So the slope of a tangent line to a position function is going to give me the instantaneous velocity. <laughs> So position functions and the um, derivative of that, which will be the velocity, um, are going to be one of the classic examples that we take a look at. This does generalize. In general, a slope of a line is just a rate of change. So the slope of a secant line is an average rate of change. And it's just that if the thing that's changing is position, we have a fancy word for that. The rate of change of position is called velocity. <laughs> and the slope of a tangent line, which is going to be our derivative, is the instantaneous rate of change. And I want to just point out that there's a very important difference between an average rate of change and an instantaneous rate of change. And I'm going to use the example of a velocity. Calculus is useful for lots and lots of things. It's not generally good for talking you out of speeding tickets. Okay. So I'm going to draw a function, a position function, as a function of time. Okay. And let's suppose that I want to go to grandmother's house. Okay. And grandmother's house happens to be 60 miles away from where I live. And I have one hour to get there. Well, that'll work just fine if I drive at 60 miles per hour the entire time. Okay. Well, let's suppose I start driving and traffic is really bad. So I'm moving really, really slowly. My position is increasing, but very, very slowly. And I sort of look at the wa my watch and I say, oh, Grandma's going to be very, very nervous. She's going to be worried if I don't get there on time. And suddenly traffic clears up. And so I just step on the gas. And now I increase my position to 60. So I end up getting there. Um, in one hour. Now, if I were to calculate the slope of this secant line right here, that's going to be 60, and that would be 60 miles per hour. So my average velocity was 60 miles per hour. Assuming I was driving along a freeway most of the time, I'm probably in pretty good shape. But this is a very sad story, because just as I near grandmother's house, I look behind me in the rearview mirror and I see these lights going, and there's a police officer who's going to pull me over, and she does. And she is concerned about that. She is concerned about the slope of the tangent line, or my instantaneous velocity. So I can try to say, oh, please, 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 Madam Officer, you don't understand. You see? Traffic was really bad, so I was going really slowly for the first half hour. So maybe I was going a little fast when you just saw me, but I was just making up for the fact that I went so slow for the first 30 minutes. So I assure you, officer, my average velocity was well within the speed limit. She's going to say, I'm sorry, I took calculus. I know that speeding tickets are given for speed, instantaneous speed, not average speed. Okay. Now in this case my velocity was positive so my velocity and my speed would actually be the same um, and so she would say I'm sorry but if we graphed your position as a function of time the slope of the tangent line when I saw you was definitely far above the speed limit and I would have to pay my speeding ticket. So very important that we know when we care about an average rate of change versus when we care about an instantaneous rate of change. That's what calculus is going to allow us to calculate, and one of the exa big examples will be when we have a position function 
so that we're calculating our instantaneous velocity.